Hello everyone, this is Moshe, the electric Israeli, and thank you for joining my channel. If you're new, please subscribe and help me change the world one electric car at a time. Thank you to all of my supporters and patrons. Um, I saw this interview with Mr. Karpathy. He is the uh, director of AI uh, in uh, Tesla. He's the one responsible for all the autopilot, uh, amazing stuff, autopilot, navigate on autopilot, and eventually the uh, chip that is going to enable Tesla to uh, do um, uh, self-driving, autonomous driving. He talked a lot about, um, uh, 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 you know, the smart summon, gave a lot of example. He talked about what is called a Pi Torch uh, open source machine. Uh, the fact that they're not using LiDAR, that Tesla is a, uh, a vertical uh, company that is committed to um, uh, uh, autonomy, uh, that Tesla's biggest advantage and the key to their success is the data collection. Uh, as of now, they have 200,000 lane change data given by drivers like me. And listen to this, 500,000 uh, uh, smart summon uh, uh, miles, uh, I, I'm sorry, activities, um, uh, from their drivers. I mean, I used it a couple of times because I think it's not necessary. I don't think it's silly. I think it's not necessary at this point. Uh, watch this interview and let me know what's your take. It's a very interesting interview. Watch it. I'll show you some, most of it. Okay. Hello, everyone. I am Andre. I am the director of AI at Tesla. And I'm very excited to be here to tell you a little bit about um, PyTorch and how we use PyTorch to train neural networks for the autopilot. Uh, now, I'm curious to do a bit of a show of hands. Uh, how many of you actually own a Tesla? <laughs> okay, a few. And how many of you have used or experienced uh, the autopilot, the product? Okay, a few. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see. Uh, so for those of you who may not be familiar with autopilot, uh, the basic functionality of the autopilot is that it keeps the car um, in the lane uh, and it keeps the car also um, away from the vehicle of, uh, away ahead of you. And then uh, some of the more advanced functionality that we've been building for the autopilot includes Navigate and Autopilot, which allows you to set down a pin somewhere on the map. And then as long as you stick to highway, uh, the car will do all of the lane changes automatically and it will take all the right forks to get you there. Um, so that's with Navigate and Autopilot. With uh, Smart Summon, which we only released about two weeks ago, uh, you can summon the car to you in the parking lot. So you hold down Come to Me, and the car comes out of its parking spot, and it will come find you in the parking lot. Uh, you get in like royalty, and uh, it's an amazing, magical feature. Um, more broadly, the team is very interested in pursuing uh, kind of uh, and developing full cell driving capability, so that's what everyone is focused on in the team. Um, now, Famously, uh, perhaps we don't use LiDAR and we don't use high-definition high maps. So everything that we built for the autopilot is basically based on computer vision, machine learning, on the raw video streams that come from the eight cameras that surround the vehicle. So this is an example of what we might uh, see in one single instant. And we process this, as you might imagine, with a lot of convol convolutional networks. Now, Tesla is a fairly vertically integrated company. Uh, and that's also true when it comes to the intelligence of the autopilot. So in particular, of course, we build our own cars and we uh, arrange the sensors around the vehicle. But then also we collect all of our data, we label all of the data, we train it on on-premise GPU clusters, and then of course we uh, take it through uh, the entire stack. We run these networks on our own custom hardware that we develop in-house. And then of course we are in charge of the full lifecycle of these features. So we deploy them to our fleet of uh, almost three quarter million uh, cars right now. And uh, we look at telemetry and try to improve the feature over time. Uh, so we kind of close the loop on, on, on this. Uh, so I would like to slightly dive into some of the distributed training that we uh, employ in the team. Um, so the bread and butter for us is, of course, analyzing images. So here's an image. In order to drive in this environment, you actually have to understand a lot about this environment. Uh, so perhaps we have to understand the traffic lights, the lane line markings, cars, and so on. So you end up in this very massively multitask setting very quickly where you just have to know a lot about the scene. So a lot of our, a lot of our networks take on this um, uh, outline here where you have kind of a shared backbone that has a number of tasks hanging off of it. And just to give you an idea of the workflows and the kinds of networks, uh, these are typically a ResNet 50-like backbones running on roughly 1,000 by 1,000 images, and then they have these heads uh, of these structures that, that make sense. 
And of course, we're doing this partly because we can't afford to have neural networks for every single task, because there's many, many tasks, almost, uh, almost 100 tasks. And so we have to amortize some of that computation. So we put them on shared backbones. Uh, so here's some examples of what these uh, networks that we call hydronets, uh, because of the shared backbone and multiple heads, uh, what these hydronets might look like. Uh, is this video playing? It's not. OK, I'm just going to go to the next video that was going to show you some line markings and so on. Uh, this is a video showing you some road edges that we are interested in for the purposes of smart summon, because we have to understand where we can be in, uh, in this environment. So we want to avoid the curbs in this case. Now, here we are making predictions in the image. And then we are, of course, casting them out and stitching them up across space and time to understand a sort of the layout of the scene around us. So here's an example of this occupancy grid. Uh, we're showing just the road edges and how they get projected. And the car winds its path around this parking lot while the person is summoning it. And it's just trying to find its way towards the goal uh, through this parking lot. Uh, so here's how things get stitched up. Uh, now, so far, if I've, I've only talked about neural networks that run on independent images. Uh, but of course, uh, very quickly, you run across tasks that actually have to be a function of multiple images at the same time. So for example, if you're trying to estimate depth of any of these images, it might actually be very helpful to have access to the other views of that same scene in order to predict the depth at every individual pixel. Or if you're trying to predict the road layout, or if you're trying to steer the wheel or something like that, you might actually need to borrow features from multiple other hydronets. So what this looks like is we have all of these different hydronets for different cameras, but then you might want to pull in some of the features from these hydronets and go to a second round of processing, optionally recurrent, and actually produce something like a road layout prediction. So this is an example of what a road layout prediction might look like for the autopilot. Um, here we are plugging in three cameras simultaneously into a neural network. And the network's predictions are not anymore in the image space. They are in the top-down space. So we're looking at the predictions of, of this network. In particular, here we are showing some of the predictions related to the corridors that are available in this parking lot, uh, where the intersections are, and what the orientations of all of these things are. And so the stitching up now doesn't happen sort of in the C++ code base. The stitching up across space and time happens inside the recurrent neural network. So more generally, what our networks start to look like um, for all of these different tasks and what we're converging on is it looks something like this. We have eight hydronets for the eight tasks. They all produce all kinds of intermediate predictions. But in addition to that, the features from these hydronets go into a second round of processing that's potentially recurrent. And then we have more outputs that are sort of in a top-down view. And then what's special about this is that this is, of course, like a pretty large single network. And every single task subsamples parts of this network and trains just that small piece. So for example, we can be training object detector on one of the cameras, or we can be training a depth network, or we can be training a layout network. All of these tasks subsample the graph and train only that portion. And then if you've trained recurrent neural networks on videos, you'll quickly kind of uh, notice uh, that uh, these are not trivial training workflows. So as an example, if I want to uh, back, uh, unroll this graph in time and backpropagate through time, maybe we have eight cameras. We unroll for 16 time steps. We use a batch size of, say, 32. Then we are going to be holding in memory 4,096 images and all of their activations in a single forward pass. Uh, so very quickly, your typical distributed data parallel <laughs> will, will break because you can't hold this amount of memory, uh, this amount of uh, activations in memory of a single GPU or even a single node. Uh, so a lot of our training potentially uh, has to combine some elements of data distribu this, uh, distributed data parallel, but also model parallelism and so on. It also gets kind of tricky in terms of training these networks uh, because the typical simplest case might be a round robin training of different tasks. So you're training task one, then every, all the workers in the pool are training task one, then task two, three, et cetera. Uh, that gets out of hand when you have 100 tasks. So instead, what might make sense is to actually have a pool of tasks. And some of the tasks are doing objects. Some of the tasks are doing road layout. Uh, sorry, some of the workers might be doing depth and so on. And these are all very heterogeneous workflows, but they coexist, and they're, tr they're training different pieces of the network at the same time. And then you can arrange them in synchronous, asynchronous way or play with this uh, to really get, squeeze out all the juice out of it. But all in all, if you're trying to train all of the neural networks for the autopilot, uh, it's actually a fairly expensive task. In particular, today, we would train 48 different networks uh, that make 1,000 different predictions. This is just if you count the number of output tensors. <laughs> and uh, it takes 70,000 GPU hours to train, to compile the autopilot, at least the neural network stack. So if you had a single node with eight GPUs, you would be training for a year. Uh, so it's a lot of networks uh, and a lot of predictions. And a lot of them must work, and none of them can regress ever. And then you're not just training this once. You, are, you have to iterate on this. So <laughs> of course, there are researchers and engineers and a team that actually have to improve on this. And so as you can imagine, uh, we do a lot of neural network training uh, at scale uh, to get this to actually uh, work. 
Um, and then we are automating a lot of the workflows. It's not just about the neural network training itself, but everything surrounding that. So in particular, we have to calibrate all the different thresholds. We have a process for that. We have a lot of uh, in the loop val uh, firmware in the loop validation, uh, other type of validation and evaluation to make sure that none of these 1,000 different predictions that we make uh, can regress and so on. And so the North Star for the team, though, is all of this can actually be automated uh, quite well. Uh, so starting with the data set, uh, you can train all the neural nets, you can do all the calibration, uh, the evaluation, and you can really start to see the continuous integration of this. And so the North Star for the team is something we internally, somewhat jokingly, refer to as operation vacation. And the idea is that as long as the data labeling team is around and they're curating and improving our data sets, then everything else can, in principle, be automated. And so we could actually go on a vacation and the autopilot improves by default. Uh, so that's something that we really try to, uh, try to uh, go towards in the team. I would like to also uh, talk a little bit about the inference aspect of this. Um, so, because I talked quite a bit about training. Uh, as I mentioned, we have sort of our own backend that our hardware team has developed. Uh, we call this the FSD computer. It offers about 144 int8 uh, tera ops of capability. Compared to the GPUs that we were using before we um, introduced this chip, this is roughly an order of magnitude improvement uh, with lower cost. So we use this in all the latest cars that are now coming out of the production line, and we target all of the neural networks to these chips. And uh, the last thing I wanted to also briefly allude to, as you'll notice here on the bottom, we have a GPU cluster. The hardware team is also working on a project we call Dojo. And a Dojo is a uh, neural network training uh, computer and a chip. And so we hope to do the exact same thing for training as we did for inference, improve uh, basically the efficiency by roughly an order of magnitude at a lower cost. Uh, but uh, I'm not ready to talk about more details on that project just yet. So in summary, I talked about the full life cycle of developing these neural networks for the autopilot and how we own everything in-house. The neural network is actually fairly complicated and large, and we deal with a lot of uh, problems if we actually want to train uh, the beast. Uh, but um, uh, it's giving us some very interesting results. And uh, the nice thing about this is not only do we get to train really awesome large networks, but we also get to ship them. And so, for example, Navigant and Autopilot has now accumulated 1 billion miles um, it, we've confirmed 200,000 lane changes, and this is a global product, product across uh, 50 countries or more now. And so that's a lot of forward passes out there <laughs> of neural networks. And with Smart Summon, uh, this is actually a bit of an outdated number. Uh, we now had 800,000 sessions of people trying to call their car to them. Uh, and so uh, it's incredible to work on such, a, such an interesting, interesting product. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the PyTorch team for being incredibly uh, responsive and helpful in uh, sort of allowing us to develop all these networks and really train them at scale and then deploy them to the real world. It's been uh, really an interesting collaboration. Thank you. So obviously, uh, Tesla is committed to uh, using their cameras as the main source uh, of their, and then later on the chip uh, as the main source for marching towards autonomy. I have made at least three videos of the issues of glare, sun glare, and phantom stop and phantom slowdown of uh, uh, the Tesla Model 3 when cars merge or when it goes from bright sunshine to shade, especially underneath um, uh, uh, bridges in the highways. It's like we'd stop right away. So there are a lot of, a lot more uh, difficulties, I would say, I would call it difficulties and challenges, but his, his explanation is amazing, amazing guy. Uh, the stuff that they talk about, I mean, Harvard, I don't even get, but you know, I get the idea. Uh, so let me know what you think. Uh, is, is autonomous actually gonna happen? I hope it does. I hope, because it's gonna be great. Let me know your thoughts, put it below in the comments. Give me a thumbs, guy, thumbs up, guys, I'll see you tomorrow.